what we have here today is Steve with us, whom I met um, not too long ago at something called the Smart Life Forum in Palo Alto, where many of the health professionals from this area meet every month and keep up to date with the current research. And he was the one person that seemed the smartest there, so I invited him to come here and, uh, and talk to us and share some of his knowledge with us. So please uh, help me in uh, welcoming Steve here and, um, and see how, what he has to say. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm about one week post-flu, so my voice may get a little bit weak, so please bear with me. I'm gonna, the, uh, the, the plan is I'm gonna spend about 40 minutes going through the presentation, and then I hopefully have 15 or so minutes left for your questions. Uh, people like to raise questions and dialogue? Okay, good. Okay, I, I did this uh, first slide with the idea of opening up the dialogue at the point of talking about cognitive performance, mental performance. What does that mean? I mean, everybody talks about intelligence and everybody knows about uh, problem solving and reaction time and, and uh, memory and things like that, but in my opinion, Mental performance is about any aspect of mental performance that relates to your health, and the number one aspect that we take for granted is sleep. And I will spend quite a bit of time on, I think, two slides talking about sleep in more, in more depth, and, uh, but I wanted to raise this question now just because I want people to think about the, uh, the context of your questions regarding smart drugs or smart nutrients. Food starting with the boring stuff, working forward, B-complex vitamins. Okay, I'll just let it ring. Um, B-complex vitamins never really get any respect. Haven't for 40 years because you're talking about one penny a day of your investment in your nutrition program. I mean, that's just, uh, it's too old and too plain, but it's really critical. Detoxification, we're starting to get into some more risky stuff in terms of stress to your body. Um, nutrients can get pretty exotic. You can spend a huge amount of money on nutrients. And amino acids get even more high tech. I'll get into that in terms of uh, brain neurotransmitter levels uh, later. And then we get into the overtly medical, hormone replacement and pharmaceuticals. And I would also put herbs somewhere in this category in terms of uh, a lot of complexity and a lot of potential for toxicity as well, even though they're natural. Okay, so I'm, I'm picking from the questions on the uh, announcement, starting off with which nutrients promote optimal brain function, and the answer is all of them. If they're deficient, they're affecting your brain. Some of these are also effective way beyond physiological levels. Uh, so uh, in a sense, we cannot use Mother Nature as a guide for optimal brain function because Mother Nature always gives us brain function per unit investment in nutrition. In the wild, the cost of a gram of vitamin C is actually quite profound. You might fall out of the tree, break your arm, and die from trying to get one gram of vitamin C. But if you're gonna buy it in your health food store, you're gonna pay between two and 20 cents for it. I mean, why worry about it? Next question I'd like to ask is, are they sustainable? Because a lot of these dietary supplement formulas out there that are designed to give you a smart pill are not really sustainable. The first day you take it, it lights you up like a Christmas tree. But after a week, after a month, you're back to baseline again. But you don't necessarily know that if you're judging the value of the supplement based on its short-term benefit to you at the point that you started to take it. So the human mind is very able to make a cause and effect connection between something that you do and an effect that happens a minute or an hour later. But if the effect is a week or a month later, good luck. It's not also about the parts. It's about how well they work together. So metabolism is a key aspect of how your brain works. 3% of your body uses 20% of your energy. 
If you have a slight downturn of, let's say, 30% in your heart function, you won't see it if you're not exercising at peak performance, but if 30% of your brain energy goes away, you are unconscious. So I'll also get around to talking about some of these other kinds of things. So this is really goes to the question of, you know, what is your orientation towards a smart drug program and being the best that you can be, that a lot of this is not exotic. It's basic food, breathing, nutrition, exercise, things that you've heard a thousand times before. So I'm not going to give you a real quick fix for how to bypass all of that. I'm going to intersperse a couple of slides. This is a really fascinating slide to me because it goes down to a really fundamental aspect of, of na nature and life that turns out to be critical to the area of having a brain at all. And that is that anaerobic organisms, the energy levels are so inadequate, the anaerobic systems, that you only get two ATP out of a, of a, of a, a glucose that's burned which is enough to give you life, but it's not enough to give you robust life. It's not enough to give you multicellular life, and it's not enough to give you a consciousness and a brain, a working brain. For that, you need aerobic metabolism, and you get 38 ATP versus two. This gives you room to play with, and this is why the brain uses massive amounts of energy. So if you focus on the issue of energy, you'll do a good job. Turns out this is critical for Alzheimer's disease. This is the slide from the Alzheimer's presentation. I'm getting it out of the way. So before anybody passes out, take a deep breath. OK, good. Um, energy production systems flow into enzyme activity, protein synthesis, healing abilities, the ion pumping in your, in your nervous system membranes, manufacture of neuro, neurotransmitters. All of these functions that are critical to the brain turn out to be dependent upon energy, cellular energy production. So the ATP is, is like the, the, the wire that keeps your brain functioning, keeps you sharp, keeps you from having Alzheimer's disease. Um, if you want to look up this, this entire presentation is uh, if you go to YouTube and type in reversing Alzheimer's disease or type in my name, you'll go to a nine-part series on Alzheimer's disease and how to reverse it. And this critical step right here that relates to the glutathione, the mercury glutathione ratio, when that fails, all of this downstream stuff happens for Alzheimer's disease. And so if you can reverse this, the Alzheimer's disease reverses. So anybody want to vote? OK. 30% of teenagers using, eating a standard American diet in public schools have IQ um, deficits that are correctable by supplementing to correct the deficiencies. 30%. And the IQ difference is um, 10 points for those kids, 30% of the kids. You give them the supplements, their IQ goes up by 10 points. This has been replicated in California and Great Britain. Two studies were done in parallel with exactly the same results. And it's been replicated in juvenile correctional facilities where they've shown that when you correct these nutritional deficiencies, you see broad changes in EEG and behavior. Here's an example of a study that was done that showed that RDA supplements of B vitamins, three B vitamins, at levels of 30 to 60 times the RDA resulted in cumulative improvement in marksmanship. So it's a, um, a blinded study. And uh, so the, uh, what was fascinating to me is that the B-complex vitamins um, have a half-life of about four to five hours, and yet the sustainability of these results was observed over 10 weeks. Here's a couple of other examples, zinc in teenage boys. Um, <coughs> the joys of masturbation lead to zinc deficiencies, and that causes the brain to stop functioning. <laughs> masturbation leads to insanity. Your grandmother was right. Vitamin D and magnesium are two very widespread deficiencies. Um, 
Anybody who lives at sea level and who lives in an urban environment is very unlikely to ever meet their adequate level of vitamin D from sunlight, even if you like uh, sunbathing without clothes. Um, typically in the winter, if you live in San Francisco, nude sunbathing will actually get you some vitamin D, but if you do that in Oakland, you will not get any vitamin D at all, even at noon. B12 and pregnenolone and melatonin in the elderly, examples of deficiencies that can be addressed that are specific to certain populations. So let me give you some examples of uh, how this works in terms of, uh, uh, this is another illustration from the, uh, from the video where it talks about the neuroprotective steroids at the base of the tree, pregnenolone and progesterone, which then go up the tree, DHEA, testosterone, the estrogens. Well, it turns out that the estrogens here have an anti-metabolic effect. They impair your synthesis of energy. And this is why women have more stamina than men. But it's also why when men get inflammation, they make more um, estrogen and they start gaining weight and they start having all kinds of health problems as well. The downside of estrogen, of having too much estrogen, is quite profound to the brain. And so if you have inflammation, this pathway gets activated, that pathway gets activated, and this pathway gets activated. So it turns these protective, beneficial, energetic steroids into anti-metabolic steroids. So if you don't watch and you have an infection, you can have cognitive consequences from it. Here's an example of a broad selection of observed effects that are highlights from stuff that I've observed over the last 30 years. Violence tendencies, memory problems, Alzheimer's disease, panic attacks. This also includes hiccups. IQ problems, senility syndromes from blood coagulation. This is also a side effect of infection. pH imbalances in the blood that impair um, oxygen and binding and release and CO2 binding and release. Brain fog. How many people have experienced brain fog? How many people are getting a little bit sleepy right now from just having eaten? Well, let's go on. We got two minutes per slide, so. <laughs> okay, how can you get a better night's sleep? First of all, pay attention. Don't take it for granted. Second one is pay attention to sound. Your brain never stops listening. When you go to sleep, your brain is still listening to what's going on around you. The paralysis that happens at the brainstem that shuts off your motor control function for your entire body does not affect your hearing, does not affect your sight, does not affect your taste buds. So make sure that you have sound that is comforting and predictable and uh, anticipated. So if you uh, live in an area where you have lots of horns honking and car alarms going off and this kind of thing, put some sound in your background that you can listen to day after day after day, night after night, so that part of your brain that's listening doesn't get alerted. Sleep with regularity. Don't stay up to five in the morning and then do an all-nighter. Sleep regularly. Sleep in the dark. Stray light suppresses melatonin. You need to be in the dark, and the dose and the timing is very critical for melatonin. And when you wake up in the morning, wake up with red light. That's the dawn and dusk effect. When the sun goes up, what color is it? Red. Okay, what, when it sets, what color is it? Red. And so dark adaptation that happens at night is mitigated by red light. So if you want to set up a light in, the, in your bedroom or in your bathroom, I have two flood lamps in my bathroom, so when I'm sitting on the john, I just turn them on and I get bathed in red light, incandescent light. Very helpful for keeping your circadian rhythm going. If you need tryptophan for serotonin, you can use that occasionally. Um, however, I suggest that you keep your dose down. There are some potential adverse health, health effects from using melatonin indiscriminate, or excuse me, tryptophan in, uh, indiscriminately or 5-hydroxytryptophan. And so if you mix your tryptophan with pre-digested collagen protein, you can use doses that are one-tenth as large and get a better hypnotic effect. This is the tough part. Anybody with chronic inflammation is gonna have consequences, health consequences, degenerative health consequences. 
But identifying inflammation, it's a tough one. You go to a doctor and ask them to help you with it, good luck. You have unlimited amounts of money, you can throw PCR tests at things and stuff, but it's, it's a really tough problem. So um, if you can focus on the issue of possible infections, uh, if you have uh, chronic issues with, for example, uh, the herpes, um, flare-ups, um, if you can imba balance yourself with vitamin D and vitamin A and reduce that, in that inflammatory effect, um, your health will benefit greatly as well as your sleep will benefit greatly. Um, food allergies, delayed hypersensitivities to things like uh, wheat or uh, corn or yeast or milk, to pick four of the top five um, food allergies, if you can clean those out of your life, you'll be better off for it. Or adding digestive enzymes to help you digest your foods. And the gut, the integrity of the gut, things like uh, zinc, for example, low-dose zinc with each meal can help tighten up your gut and prevent food, uh, undigested food particles from passing in and producing inflammation. And if you need a sleep drug, don't use Ambien. Use Xyrem. Xyrem is a nutrient. It was uh, uh, declared to be the date rape drug by the FDA, and then they made it a prescription orphan drug. It's now available. And uh, Xyrem is a great way to get very, very good sleep. And it's one of the few drugs that enhances the stage three and stage four architecture uh, phases of sleep. Normally when you go to sleep, you go stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and then up into rapid eye movement, and that takes about 90 minutes. And as we age, the stage three and stage four phases get compromised. And by the time people reach middle age, oftentimes they will not have any stage four sleep at all. And by the time people hit 70 to 90, they usually don't have any stage three sleep as well. And what this means is, is that you're not really asleep at night, and you're not really awake during the day. You need to be deeply asleep to be deeply awake. And Xyrem does that. It specifically enhances stage three and stage four sleep. Uh, by the way, this is 100 times more expensive than it was as a nutrient before the FDA took it off the marketplace. Uh, here's a challenge for the, uh, the, the, the geeks in the audience, the nerds. You know, a perfect audience to, uh, to consider this. High-tech solution, do-it-yourself sleep studies. So what you can do is you can set up a camcorder and videotape and audio tape your sleep at night, play it back at 10 times speed the next day and see what's going on with your sleep. Are you waking up? Are you vocalizing? Are you moving? Is your breathing changing? Do you have apnea? All of that stuff can be verified at home. At some point in the next 10 years, this will probably be over the counter. Right now, there's a vacuum. Is there an alternative to SRI drugs? Lots. Let's start with the least respect, B vitamins, the Rodney Dangerfield of, of nutrients. Yes? What's uh, SRI? Serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're also called SSRIs, although the first S is really more promotion than fact. So I just delete the first S. Um, Zoloft, Paxil, um, mineral deficiencies, correcting mineral deficiencies and discovering undisclosed or unrecognized toxicities. I have a 94-year-old client who had uh, Alzheimer's disease who had an undiagnosed lead toxicity. So these things can go on for 20, 40, 60 years and you don't know about it. Yes? Uh, what is the deficiency? A deficiency? Oh, well, there's, that's a good question. The question is, um, what is a deficiency, and are there numbers attached to it? And the answers are yes. However, there isn't a consensus on it. So if you go to um, vitamin diagnostics in New Jersey and ask them, they'll define it in terms of normative numbers. How many standard deviations in a general population? Are, are you in, you know, above, below? Um, so they define it based on statistics. Um, and most medical tests are done that way. You get a cholesterol level, it's based on statistics. You get a thyroid uh, T4, TSH level, it's based on st statistics. But there are other kinds of companies like Spectracell in, in Texas who do a functional assay. 
So they're looking at the ability of white blood cells to proliferate in the presence of a nutritional challenge. And so if you take away B12 and your cells, your cells immediately stop proliferating, then they presume this means you have very, very low B12 reserves. And so they're defining deficiency in that, in that context as the performance of those cells under a stress. Um, but in terms of you know, minerals, for example, I would define it in terms of enzyme activity. In other words, uh, superoxide dismutase uses copper, and so is the activity of superoxide dismutase increased if you supplement copper? If the answer is yes, then you were deficient. If the answer is, if there's a slight increase, then you were slightly deficient. If there's a massive increase, you were seriously deficient. So there's a lot of that kind of question going on. Um, all I can say is that um, you cannot assume that kind of question in a straightforward manner and be able to even interpret your own medical results. I've had uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of clients over 30 years who've come to me with thyroid workups that were, one was done right. Hundreds of people, one was done right. And I've had somebody come to me with the range from, let's say, uh, 10 to 100, and they got 11. And the doctor says, oh, your thyroid is normal. You don't have hypothyroidism. Okay? And yet when we give that person thyroid hormone, boom, their energy goes up, their depression goes away, um, they start sleeping soundly, they lose 20 pounds of weight, and you know, on every measure of functionality, they're better off. But according to the numbers, statistically, they were fine before. Uh, neurotransmitter precursors, a huge aspect of depression. And you can load them up. Tryptophan, 5-hydroxytryptophan, is a precursor for serotonin. So if you take it and your depression goes away, guess what? So you can take Paxil to raise your serotonin, Zoloft, or you can take 5-HTP or tryptophan to do it and see, does it work? You go to a standard doctor, they're not going to even mention this option to you. D-L-phenylalanine or L-phenylalanine um, or tyrosine uh, will raise your catecholamines. It's another potential cause of depression. Hypothyroidism, I just mentioned. Get a proper workup. You have to know the right questions to ask. And you want to have, check the results yourself. Anytime a doctor does a thyroid test and, and just tells you you're fine, ask for the copy of the results. I'd suggest you do that anyway. You should keep a copy of your own medical record in total. Estrogen dominance, iodine therapy is one way to shift estrogen dominance. Um, estriol is a uh, estrogen hormone that gets very little respect and iodine helps uh, uh, push estrogens into the estriol form. Estriol is protective against uh, autoimmune diseases in both men and women. In women it's been proven and in men it's just inferred, but um, I'm convinced that it's actually true. Um, estrogen dominance in men, don't take your doctor's word for it when they say estrogen is, a, is the female hormone. It's not true. Estrogen is the off hormone in both men and women, and if your estrogen is high, you need to know about this. If you are going to take SRI drugs, you can take them with tryptophan or 5-hydroxytryptophan. <coughs> So that when this serotonin reuptake inhibitor interferes with the recycling of serotonin, which is what it's doing, and causes a corresponding depletion of your serotonin storage form, the 5-HT will correct that. And so your doctor may tell you that, oh yes, you can have serotonin syndrome and die from taking these two together, but actually you have to be quite careless to actually make that happen. And if you do it with care and deliberation, it is entirely safe. Oh, this is a fun one. <laughs> I really like uh, talking about nutrition myths. And uh, that whole thing about masturbation leading to insanity was part of an earlier talk <coughs> about myths and nutrition, where I threw that one in the middle just to wake everybody up. Um, but there's a lot of nutrition myths out there in the world today, and some of them are being promoted by industries that have a vested interest in, in having you use their products. Others are based on just plain ignorance, people not knowing what the true information about things are. These are old myths. How many have heard this? Hydrogenated fats are perfectly safe. That means you're pretty old, right? 
I mean, that's what I grew up with, corn oil. My father was a cardiologist, and I grew up on corn oil. And that was part of that, that kind of, uh, of myth at the time. Uh, vegetable oils and margarines are safer than butter. That was the myth. It's all crap. Bovine soil enhancement. Eating low fat can make you thin. We're now in a more modern myth. Complex carbs are best for insulin resistance. This is the advice given to people with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes by the American Diabetic Association. It's not true. Eating fat causes heart disease and obesity. Tropical oils, I mean, we remember that campaign in about um, popcorn in the movie theaters. Was it about 15, 20 years ago? And coconut oil used to be used regularly in, in movie theaters, and all of a sudden it became some huge crime. And it turns out it was the, um, the U.S. oil industry that paid for that, abetted by the U.S. government, and it wasn't true at all. Tropical oils are not dangerous at all. Milk and bread are good, healthy foods. Of course, it's the milk purveyors and the bread salesmen who are telling us that. Yeah. How many people here have heard that milk is one very fast way to develop osteoporosis? 10 or 12 people. It's pretty good. You're, you're ahead of the curve. But it's true. The correlation with osteoporosis is not that milk is protective. It's actually a risk factor. Uh, one question. Yes. So what is now exactly bad about milk and bread? I mean, What's uh, bad about milk and bread? Yes, if the milk, is, milk and bread is good, then uh, the fact should be milk and bread is bad. So. That's right. It is. And, and for is the that? average person. And the reason is because of inflammation. That for most people, when you consume milk products, you have an inflammatory response. And that's probably true of you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of people, depending upon uh, what your ethnic background, your race is. If you are black, um, you're probably 95 percent likely to have inflammation from drinking milk. If you're white, then maybe it's 50 percent. Um, in terms of bread, um, bread is a source of wheat, and wheat contains a protein called gluten, which is extremely difficult to digest. And undigested a gluten protein is an inflammatory effect that causes all kinds of degenerative problems and stress to your gut and um, inflammatory effects producing heart disease and probably cancer as well. And so my suggestion is um, don't drink milk and don't eat bread. <laughs> very, very, very straightforward. Just eliminate those from your system. And if you're going to eat them, um, eat them rarely so that, you know, the reason that you're eating the bread is because you've gone to Aunt Mildred's house for, for Christmas and you're trapped. And so we say it's okay, it's once a year, twice a year, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and if you can, take digestive enzymes with you to help offload the burden. It's not just um, wheat that is difficult to digest. Corn is difficult to digest. Um, uh, red meat is difficult to digest. Yeast very, very difficult to digest. The cell wall of yeast is not something that humans have a good enzyme profile for digesting it. Um, so, um, uh, you know, try to keep those kinds of things under control, particularly if you have signs of inflammation. If your estrogen to testosterone ratio is high in estrogen, then you want to look for these kinds of triggers. So, me. Yes. Milk includes any milk product? Uh, no. Uh, it, it, well, it does on some level. Uh, I would put, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is, when you feed milk to m microbes, the microbe takes the brunt of it. Okay, so, you know, yogurt, there's still milk content in it because it's a fairly soft kind of cheese, a fresh kind of cheese. Same thing with cottage cheese. But when you start to deal with, you know, cheddar or aged cheddars, the, the content of milk is going down and down and down the longer the milk has been um, uh, fermenting. And, and the bugs in it. So, so the process, I, mean, uh, I can't hear. There's a, too much noise. You, can you stand up to the microphone? And what about the difference between raw milk and, and processed milk? Uh, yes, there, the raw milk has uh, 
uh, good fat structure and um, that's destroyed by the homogenization. Homogenized milk causes uh, enzyme irritation of the vascular system, xanthine oxidase. So it's true that raw milk is way better, but in terms of, of, of allergy, um, it may not be better at all. So it depends on your system and whether or not you're handling it well or not. There is a test that you can do if you want to find out, is go off of milk for two weeks. All milk products, all egg, you know, butter, anything with dairy, go off of it for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, sit down at a table with a friend and engage in conversation for about three hours, set up a tape recorder, set up a metronome, adjust the metronome so that it's not fast and not slow and it's just synchronized with your, with your body and then put one drop of milk under your tongue and watch what happens and ask your friend to watch what happens. If you freak out, if the metronome slows down, you're allergic to milk. Okay, if your pulse rate goes up dramatically, you're allergic to milk. Vitamins only enrich the sewer. We're going back to the old days, but there's still people out there who have that kind of attitude. Okay, here's some myths to live by. Um, I'm not going to say this is all quite scientific because I think that on some level it's based on prejudice and philosophy and all kinds of stuff, but um, low-carb vegetables is a main, mainstay for the diet. Eat meat, either tiny amounts to moderate amounts. Tiny amounts can just be simply the, the bugs in your grain, as it is in India. Um, but we need small amounts of meat to get our vitamin B12. Um, cultivate fat burning mode, this is a big one. In my opinion, the graceful agers in the world are all in fat burning mode. This is not emphasized in our modern society and doesn't happen if we overeat carbohydrate, which is a cultural thing. But um, Get into ketosis, cultivate your fat burning mode, flip back and forth into ketosis and out, so you exercise that part of your metabolism. And that, to do that, consume tropical oils. Coconut oil is my favorite. Um, eat less carbs and calories than your peers. Under eat is a healthy lifestyle. And uh, so, okay, here's my words of wisdom. If their lips are moving, they're lying. <laughs> okay, industry ads, they want to sell you milk. They want to sell you oils that are grown in the United States. Coconut oil is grown in the tropics. So that's why the prejudice is in, in those industry ads. The food pyramid is upside down. Okay, again, the government agents that put that together are working for the industry. Assume your doctor, your doctor is profoundly ignorant. And that doesn't mean that they're not smart. They're exceedingly smart. They know all kinds of stuff that they really don't need to know. But the part is, the question is, what do they not know? And what risk does this put you at? What does their ignorance put you at? And doctors will rarely admit their ignorance. You ask them a question they don't know, they'll make it up. Most of them. But if you know what your doctor knows and you know what your doctor doesn't know, you're in a better position to protect yourself against possible adverse side effects. I had one client that was almost killed because the doctor was using serum potassium to judge his potassium requirement. And he was told by, his, by, the, by the patient and by his wife that he's a potassium overaccumulator and therefore giving him potassium was dangerous. The doctor said, no, 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 no. Serum potassium is an accurate indicator of potassium status and put it in his IV and drove him into heart failure. Even had him on digoxin before he, it, and he still didn't admit that um, that was inappropriate action. Wife had to check him out of the hospital to save his life. And I'm an expert that you should also believe is biased. Good. You're not asleep. Don't work in a sick building. Okay, you've got good people taking care of you here, but if you work in a building where you have formaldehyde or acetaldehyde in the air, you get sick. I had a friend who went to the, who was a teacher at the Oakland uh, Public School, Oakland uh, City um, High School, who they did a complete earthquake retrofit during the summer and had double time and triple time crews in the building 
uh, putting in carpeting and painting and uh, new particle board furniture and stuff. And the, on the Monday, all the kids came in and the teachers came in. They had a 30 percent um, absentee rate for the next three months from people getting sick. Well, when those people started uh, using vitamin C and cysteine, they became symptom free. This goes back to 1975 when a um, research group gave um, C and cysteine to animals that were exposed to an LD90 dose of acetaldehyde and which is enough to kill 90% of the animals and make the other 10% violently sick. And when they were given the C and cysteine, they didn't get sick. They didn't die. None of them got sick and none of them died. That's how powerful this particular formula is. You can go out and drink yourself unconscious and not have a hangover unless you have the, uh, the genetic polymorphism, in which case you may have some residual hangover. So Asians, Native Americans, Irish, other, other populations also contain that. Uh, it's called alcohol or aldehyde dehydrogenase, and there's a deficiency, a genetic uh, uh, mutation that a lot of people carry that impairs their ability to smoothly metabolize alcohol. But this formula helps take care of that. You take one capsule for, before the first round, one capsule between each round, and one capsule after the last round, drink a glass of water, and go to sleep. Pretty simple. So here's the, uh, the, re the, the basic, the active group is the sulfhydro group here uh, from cysteine. And cysteine is uh, found in glutathione. It's a component of it. And cysteine is also found in N-acetylcysteine, which is a dietary supplement form that seems to have some improved uh, transport abilities. So for some people, it works better. This is the metabolic pathway. And I'm going to partially get into all the negative stuff that happens from alcohol, from cross-linking effect, which is by far the most dangerous uh, process. Um, this is what gives you wrinkled skin. Uh, carcinogenicity happens as well, but the detoxification pathway here um, prevents all of these other pathways, competes against them. That's how it works. Benefits of alcohol are pretty obvious. Lifestyle, biological effects. And so costs of alcohol, cross-linking, wrinkles, organ damage, liver damage, oxidative stress, hangovers, pro-aging, addiction through glucose addiction, serotonin addiction, and NADH addiction. <coughs> Cancer and degenerative diseases. Poisons. Methanol, which is protected by the sulfhydro compounds, which is found in some alcoholic drinks, and fermentation residues that are found in a lot of distilled drinks. Um, the, the, some of these are protected against and some of them are not by that alcohol formula. You don't need to know this. Okay. Um, here's contact information. I can flip back to this if you'd like, but what I'd like to do now is open it up for questions, and here's some su su suggestions if you can't come up with your own. So uh, step up and so ask on the microphone, please. I have a question about this uh, milk bread thing. I mean, um, I just had to laugh when I see this. Uh, like half the world, or probably more than half the world, is eating bread and uh, milk like for more than, I don't know, 10,000 years, and you're telling me no, 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 don't do this. I mean, I personally think that's crazy, but uh, like, what, is, what else should I do? Should I drink water or, so instead of eating milk and bread, should I take like 100 different colored pills? I mean, is that gonna oh, help? Oh, no. Uh, I mean, you can, but I don't think it's particularly wise. Okay. Um, not only are you gonna spend a fortune, but you're not gonna get good, very good nutrition. Uh, the issue is, I mean, certainly children can tolerate milk, but if you look at infant studies and feeding uh, when, for, for one reason or another, um, children cannot be breastfed. Best breastfed. Um, the, 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 there's all kinds of consequences that happen. And, and um, if you give prenatal infants uh, milk products, um, there's a good chance you're going to kill them. So if you, if you read the literature on milk, it's pretty straightforward. And the reason that you may not know about it is because very little of that gets publicized. Um, I think any kind of fluid would probably be better than milk in, in, overall, but milk has nutrition in it. There's, there's uh, calcium, although, you know, that's what it's promoted for. 
that milk has calcium, but it turns out that in terms of calcium, it's not a very good uh, food. You get better food, better calcium levels from grain, for example. But I'm also telling you to avoid grain. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> so I'm not. The, but, the uh, question comes down to what do you eat? And I'd say the answer is um, the Paleolithic diet is the one that humans are probably best adapted to. And that is um, unlimited greens, particularly low-carb vegetables, the low-carb vegetables, and um, fruit and nuts when they're in season, and meat when you can kill it. Okay, um, so one thing I've noticed about milk is that um, in the US or maybe um, uh, North America is probably the only continent where you can find um, uh, in, in uh, lots of like low fat and half fat and whatnot milk. Like in most other countries, it doesn't exist. In Japan, for example, there's only milk that has like 4.5% fat and you know, Japanese people, people are pretty healthy on, on average. Well, it's, I mean, not it's, the, it's not the fat that, that is my concern. It's the casein and whey in the milk that are, in my consider, opinion, the, the risk factors. And the, uh, uh, the uh, galactose. Um, for example, anybody, any, uh, in the United States, any low-fat milk product has had um, milk solids added to it to give it a mouthfeel. That produced cataracts. I mean, that's a prescription for eye problems. And it doesn't matter whether you get 1% non-fat, 1%, 2%, 3%. It all starts from non-fat milk in which they take the, the, the fat and add it back. So they sti it still has the non-fat milk solids in it. So um, I'd say go back to raw milk and drink it with all the fat if you're going to do that. And if you don't want the milk and you, you react badly to it, find any other kind of food and you'll do, you'll do better with it. I mean, right. people who don't drink milk as a whole have a lower risk of osteoporosis. So the whole idea of calcium as being essential for milk is fundamentally just a PR campaign. Hi, yes. I was a little confused as to what advice you had in terms of insulin resistance. Um, you mentioned complex carbohydrates, and you know, clearly, I, I'm guessing what you mean is um, something along the lines of, oh, well, even if it's complex carbs in your bread, it's not as good as, say, eating vegetables, or uh, you know, what yeah. are you suggesting for insulin-resistant individuals? Yes. Vegetables. And carbohydrate control is the number one prescription for insulin resistance. You know, keeping your carbohydrate down to the point that your body is burning fat as a, as a, for, for energy, as a fuel, um, that's the fastest way to re reverse insulin resistance. Ketosis, if you can manage it, if you're actual diabetic, you need to manage that medically to do it, you know, safely. But if you're just pre-diabetic, you know, it, you just have insulin resistance, get into ketosis. <coughs> Can you explain ketosis? Uh, ketosis is, um, there's two kinds of fat burning mode in your body. Um, and ketosis is where your liver is burning the fat and exporting what are called ketone fuels to the rest of your body. Okay, so the fat is basically taking the, 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 the liver is taking the fat which is, let's say, anywhere from 12 to 20 carbons long, usually 16, 18, and it clips it in four carbon fragments. And those are exported to the body. Those are called ketone fuels. And the affinity of your body's tissues for them is about 10 times what it is for glucose. So if you take, a, 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 let's say, a rodent with induced congestive heart failure and you in, inject them with ketone fuels, you'll see a 50% uh, increase in heart ejection fraction in 30 minutes. That's how fast it is. And all of the tissues of the body, the, the liver, the kidney, you know, the muscles, they all absorb these ketone fuels at a very, very high rate, uh, very efficiently. And so when you're in ketosis, it's, it's a very good way of handling issues like uh, end-stage organ failure but it's not used by our current medical system. Uh, in terms of the, the, uh, uh, the, the alternative to ketosis, it's just called beta oxidation. This is what the, what the liver does to make ketones, but 
all the tissues of your body are also capable of burning fat. Okay, so they just take the fat and instead of absorbing it from the liver, um, they're just taking the fat and clipping it themselves. And this gives you a source of energy that's independent of glucose. So if you're insulin resistant you're, and you're depending upon glucose for energy, your energy is sabotaged, you're, you're browned out. Instead of having 110 volts, your brain's living on 90 volts or 70 volts. It's gonna affect how your brain works. But if you go into ketosis, now you've got sugar energy and you've got ketone fuels for energy, your backup generator is now on. So you're now back up to 110 volts, even if you're still insulin resistant because your backup generator is able to give you that extra voltage to make it work. And what happens is, is that your insulin resistance reverses as you have these ketone fuels out there, and so you become better and better able to burn glucose by burning fat. Does that make sense? Okay, I could ask you a lot of questions, and I you can. hopefully I'll save but them until later. Yeah, me, there's people in my mind. Just a book, if you haven't seen it, Gary Taubes. Good calories, bad calories. He's moving out to the Bay Area next, you know, sometime soon, so we may have him here to talk. Okay, great. April speaker at the Smart Life Forum. All right. All right. So you mentioned glutathione, which uh, I read, you know, lots of great things about that, but I've also read that just taking it directly does not give you much, uh, that it doesn't get absorbed very much. Uh, uh, what can you say about that? It, there's, it's true. There is a problem absorbing it, but the, the people who say that none of it is absorbed, uh, they're lying. So okay. there are people who are saying, you know, you can't take glutathione because it's digested. Well, uh, maybe half of it is digested, or maybe three quarters of it is digested, or maybe one quarter. So there is some benefit that you get from it. But it is true, it's very inefficient. Um, but the real problem is it's not sustainable. There's all kinds of research in people selling dietary supplements with cysteine and N-acetylcysteine in it, saying it raises your glutathione. Well, there's a real problem with that, because if you look a day later and two days later, you see it does raise glutathione. But if you look a week and two weeks and two months later, you find out it doesn't keep it up. Well, they the, also body's, prescribe... the body's corrective mechanism compensates for the intervention. Mm. I see. Yeah, and I've seen uh, N-acetylcysteine is also prescribed as a decongestant, so I don't know to, if taking that over time is good. But one other question that I'll get... It's also an excitotoxin, like aspartate and glutamate and aspartame, oh, NutraSweet. Um, it's an irritant to the brain and can, can aggravate calcium toxicity in the brain. Okay. Yes. Um, as, so I'm 51, and I've, I have cataracts. And I have a friend who's 49 who has cataracts, or just like her doctor said. And, and I'm wondering if you know, uh, and by the way, I haven't, uh, taken, I haven't drunk milk for years. I got off that, I do like hazelnut milk, I think it's wonderful. But uh, I was wondering if you're aware of, you know, so is there an increase in cataracts in our society? Is there something you're suspicious of causing this? Or, or, um, or if you had any I think the that. connection to milk is, is, the, is the real obvious one, but um, there's a lot of falling apart going on around us. I mean, it's, uh, autism is way up, brain cancer is way up. Um, hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of different conditions that I think are uh, uptrending, obesity, uh, insulin resistance. Uh, uh, Anybody else want to pipe up from something out there? So this is not an uncommon thing. And, you know, when you look at some of the old research, um, there's, there's a, a, a cumulative effect that's observed with nutritional deficiencies. If you take animals and you run them through several generations, each generation the nutritional deficiency has persisted, the effects become more and more intractable. And I think that, that that's going on with us, that we've been degenerating our diet for long enough that it wasn't just, it's not just us. It's our parents and our grandparents who were starting this earlier with different kinds of things. I was raised on coconut oil. That means my cancer likelihood is probably triple what it would have been if I hadn't been. Hmm? Corn oil, excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Coconut, corn, is just, okay. Yes. Um, so I actually had three questions for you, and you took the first one away just now, um, because your recommendations are all pretty consistent with good calories, bad calories. Obviously, 
you would agree with that and endorse that. And, and uh, Ray Pete's uh, advice, I think, has mm -hmm. been consistently good for about 30 years. He's one of those pioneers. Um, this is stuff that I've been talking about for a long, long, long time. I'm just glad to put up anybody else as an authority beyond me mm -hmm. for this kind of thing because um, there is a problem anytime you go out in public and challenge the big lie. So this leads me to my second question, which is, um, I don't know if I missed this from the bio on the page or something, but if we don't trust anybody, why should we trust you? What, what, you what's your background or what's your qualifications for all you this? Sh you shouldn't trust me. You should always have some doubt for everything that you're told. Um, I'm an organic chemist, so that's my background. Biochemistry, neurochemistry, all of this. But everything I'm talking to you about, I learned outside of an educational institution. So I don't have a PhD to hold up there. And as a result, I think about the world in ways that are different from people who have been through the PhD mill, who were institutionalized, who did, were educated in an institution. And so there's a certain level of, of enablement that happens with that, and there's a certain blindness that happens with it too, where people become tracked. I mean, my day job is nanotechnology development. Well, it turns out that my core invention for, for nanostructural self-assembly system was based on knowledge that I learned in 1972 in my sophomore organic chemistry class that, in, when, that I drew, drew upon when I was hired as a consultant in 2002. I went back to 1972, 30-year-old information, and invented a polymer because I was just looked at it differently than everybody else looked at it. And it took me three days to invent it. It took me three weeks to even admit that it was an invention because it was so obvious. So my third question, um, you didn't really talk about this, but it, the buzzword showed up on the slide, and it's something that makes me very nervous. You talked about detoxification. And there's a lot of quack schemes out there claiming to be detoxification schemes. But it seems like some people actually might know what they're talking about also claim to have something to say about detoxifications. So could you speak a little bit about that? I, I think it's true. And I'm not an expert enough to give you the, 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 the pros and cons of all of it. I have the same reaction to herbalists. There are a lot of really amazing herbalists out there. But there are also a lot of you know, people who dabble. And herbs are potentially dangerous. 5% of the weight of the average plant is devoted to chemicals that are designed to kill you. I mean, that's how the plant survives. I mean, it can't run away. It uses chemical warfare. So wheat has estrogens that make male animals infertile, you know, male grain you know, for the buffalo. And, and um, you know, mustard has mutagens in it. And um, uh, alfalfa sprouts have uh, cannabinine, which is an, uh, an arginine mimic. So it produces autoimmune disease in, in uh, humans and in uh, chimpanzees. So, you know, plants are not put there to be our foods uh, from their own perspective. I mean, they don't want to get eaten any more than we want to get eaten. Um, so uh, that, that kind of issue of, of what, the, what role toxicity plays is, in my opinion, not obvious. For example, um, you, how many people have heard anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Well, to some extent, um, uh, phytotoxins are like that that when you expose yourself, you eat a very, very plant-rich diet, you get all of these chemicals coming in your body, your liver's capacity for detoxifying things gets higher and higher and higher and higher. And so you may be much better off having that, that overall defense being higher than you would be if you avoided all toxins, which we know when that's been done is invariably very, very bad for the animals that are involved. In other words, if you eat a refined diet, not only are you going to live half as long as you normally would, but your resistance to flu and accidents and traumas is way, way, way down. So there is something about stress and the adaptive capacity that's induced by stress that is helpful. And this is exercise. How many people have heard of exercise is good? Yeah? <laughs> Right. Well, exercise produces free radicals. Stress is your antioxidant defense system at the same time. But I'm suggesting that that's not bad, that the adaptive capacity is good. So here we are living in, you know, in, in Googleplex, and we have a radiation level that is half of what people have who live in Denver. And yet, do they have twice as much cancer in Denver? No. Do they have twice as much free radical damage in Denver? No. It's because 
both of us live in a realm of radiation that is within the human adaptive capacity. You can go up to 10,000 feet of altitude and still be within that window. You put a human in a nuclear reactor and they die. But there's a bug, a microbe, that can live inside the primary loop of a nuclear reactor. And that's because they have this massive adaptive capacity for oxidative stress. And so they're able to handle it, you know, 10, you know, 20 times background radiation. So there's a lot of aspects of detoxification, a lot of aspects of, of health that are fundamentally based on, on stress and living in a polluted world. And, and plant pollution or plant toxins are uh, not fundamentally different from man-made chemicals if you look at them from the perspective of what percentage of them are carcinogens or what percentage of them are mutagens. The percentages are identical. But there may be some argument to say that on some level maybe we're adapted, well adapted, to eating phytotoxins. Um. So my question is regarding allergy testing and elimination. And you mentioned when testing for a milk allergy to eliminate it for two weeks. And I've seen uh, some sort of detox programs that are basically around eating well for three weeks and eliminating things like bread and, and, and milk and so on. Uh, so my question is, where does the, the two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, where does this number come come from and, okay. and how do you know what's appropriate? Uh, the, the, I picked two weeks because the delayed hypersensitivity, delayed hypersensitivity time frame is seven to ten days, seven to nine days. In other words, if you make uh, IgA, IgG, or IgM antibodies to something, um, it's going to take um, six to nine days for those to fade away. And so if you try to do something in less time than that, you're not going to you're not going to have a good baseline. Um, and so two weeks is enough time for those, that, that response to attenuate. And so now you're, in a sense, restoring at least a partially naive body. Um, but you can certainly do it longer. Um, but when I look at asking somebody to go for, off of milk for two weeks, is like asking somebody to change their religion. I mean, this is a lifestyle adaptation which is on the par with uh, an alcoholic giving up booze or something like this. And so I try to only ask people for some, what I would consider a kind of minimal level of performance to make the challenge as feasible as possible. You know, bottom line is if you're not going to do it, it, it doesn't matter if I tell you that you can do it. And so to make it worse, you know, you're just making it, you know, tougher for people to, to, to comply. Uh, but so two weeks is, in my opinion, uh, you know, a very good choice. It, it fits into people's natural, you know, time frames. People tend to organize their lives in terms of weeks. And so if you say one week, that's obviously not enough. Three weeks is a week too long, so two weeks is fine. Uh, you, you have one more question? Coffee. Coffee. Yes. You what want you? coffee? Yes, I, I want coffee. Um, no, is is there a bad side to coffee? No. What's, what's the uh, real effect on brain performance? Oh, um, well, caffeine is a, an insecticide. I mean, uh, if you take coffee and you feed it to insects, they all die. And, um, the, you know, coffee beans don't really need to keep from being eaten by humans because humans typically don't hang out where coffee grows. And so, you know, but coffee beans do have, you know, to defend themselves against other animals and, and insect predators and stuff like that. So, I mean, how many people have vegetable gardens? Okay. How many people use their coffee grounds in their vegetable gardens? Okay. Half of them. Yeah, it's a very good insecticide. You put coffee into uh, growth media for fruit flies, and they'll never develop. They'll all die. So, but in humans, humans, caffeine is not so poisonous in humans. It's merely an irritant. Uh, irritant to our central nervous system, and so we get edgy from it, we get a, a lift, and, um, which we use constructively. But it lasts for about two hours, which 
corresponds to the timing of coffee breaks in the institutional workplace. And the downside is, is that it's going to interfere with your sleep and it's going to interfere with your DNA replication, your DNA repair mechanisms. And so it's probably better if humans don't get exposed to caffeine, but on the whole, it's a relatively minor, um, you know, irritant in the, in the big picture. And this Ah, okay, well, uh, step right up. Uh, the question is, what kinds of tests would I recommend to find out whether people have deficiencies? And there's two ways to go that I suggest. One is the medical route. Go to your doctor and ask for certain tests. Those would include uh, a red blood cell trace mineral profile, a uh, couple hundred bucks. And they test maybe 30, 40 different nutrients. Um, you can also get uh, normative blood cell uh, uh, vitamin levels. Um, you can have the SpectraCell um, functional medicine tests for nutrients. You can do uh, urine chelation challenge to find out if you have lead poisoning or mercury or cadmium, bismuth uh, uh, toxicity. Um, the other way is to do it on what I call the self-care option. In other words, you take it and you notice, does it work or not? Measure your brain and then see before and after does taking the nutrient help. And if it does, does it continue to help after two weeks or two months? So do an ABAB process on it after you've been on it for two months and stop and see if you note a decline in your scores. Of course, this requires you to be diligent about measuring your brain function. And there's basically several ways to do it, one of which is just to pay attention. Well, the average person can't tell a 30% drop in their mental performance from None at all. In other words, we're pretty insensitive. So that would suggest to me that you need to cultivate computer games, something that's going to measure eye-hand coordination, dexterity, simple decision making, complex decision making, um, uh, Tetris, you know, two-dimensional, three-dimensional rotations of blocks and how fast you can do it, a game where you have a cascade failure design where the game gets faster and faster and faster and, uh, you know, over time, and when you make a mistake, it then jumps up faster as well. So, so both the, game, the time frame and the, the number of mistakes both lead you towards a failure. With this kind of data, you can make decisions extremely rapidly in terms of B1, B12, um, you can know in one week whether or not that's a significant, uh, on a scientific basis. You can know in one day just experientially. But if you want to do an ABAB process, it'll take you a week to do it, and then you'll know for sure. And that's a lot cheaper, fundamentally, if you're already a nerd enough to do the study, the, the measurements of yourself, and to build that infrastructure so that you have a really nice data stream and you can tell when it trends up or when it trends down. And the nice thing about doing that, which is why I do it and why I suggest other people do it, is that when you go into a hospital and you get elective surgery and you find that the anesthesia hasn't fully worn off, you will see the downtrend event from that um, anesthesia and you'll know that there's something that hasn't been resolved. And you go back to the doctor and say, I need T3 monotherapy for a week or something else to restore your metabolism that the doctor believes is there is no residual effect from. Oops, I'm late. Overtime. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. That was it. Uh... Thank <laughs> you.